Hello and welcome to today's Themis webinar. Hi, my name is John Mullins and I'm from Themis and I'll be your host today. Today's presenter will be Linda Clausen. She's also from Themis and I'll introduce her here in just a moment. Uh, today's webinar, as you can see on the screen there, will focus on uh, function level 504 for DB212 on the ZOS platform. Um, during today's webinar, if you should happen to have any questions, um, I'll talk about that in just a moment, but you can also see Linda's email address on the screen uh, there. So if you have any questions or comments um, today or down the road, feel free to email Linda at lclawson at themisinc.com. You can also see on the screen there um, a, a web address for Themis at themisinc.com slash webinars. Uh, slides for t uh, today's webinar, they're currently available out there for you to download, so feel free to visit, visit that uh, website. Um, if you just go to themisinc.com, there'll be a webinars tab up at the top. There you can uh, go into there, you'll see uh, Linda's slides available for download. You also will see dozens of other past webinars uh, available um, where their slides and their recorded presentations will be available for you to uh, take a look at also. So feel free to take a look out there, browse around, lots of good information, uh, past webinars, not only on mainframe and DB2 stuff, but on things like uh, Java, Oracle, other uh, SQL, um, and other web type of related webinars out there. And they go back four or five years, so lots of good stuff to take a look at there. Um, in addition to all that, um, feel free to follow and get, get up to date uh, news and information about future events from Themis. You can follow us on Twitter at Themis Training. All right, today's webinar, you know, DB212 um, function level 504, it's part of a bigger class, uh, you know, a formal class that we had to offer. And you can see the title of it there on the screen. Uh, DB212 for ZOS Transition, what administrators need to know. That's a three-day class, and it's next on our public schedule for June 1st. Um, you can go out to themisinc.com uh, for more information on registering for that class. Um, you can also, if, if you get a copy of today's slides, if you click on the uh, the link that's associated with that title up above there where, where it says what administrators need to know, that'll take you in there. Um, also. And then on top of all that, it's exciting to offer uh, you as well. Uh, when you do register for that June 1st class, uh, there is a discount code available. Um, the discount code is, as you can see on the slide there, is DB2Webinar. Um, with that, you can get a 20% discount on that June 1st class. So that's great news. All right, I'd like to now introduce you to today's presenter, Linda Clausen. Uh, Linda's a senior technical advisor for Themis, and she brings to us 30 plus years of experience in the mainframe and DB2 worlds, where she has acted in various roles, including application developer, project manager, DBA, and systems programmer. Uh, many of you likely already know of Linda from her many speaking engagements at conferences and user groups, and you may have even had a class with her. So welcome back. Uh, Linda, I'm sure will be excited to uh, see your name in the uh, attendee list today. Um, with that said, Linda also enjoys checking out new technology and she loves sharing, uh, sharing her knowledge with people just as she will be doing today. All right, before I turn it over to Linda, you can see here on this slide here, if you do have any questions, uh, you may have noticed in the uh, control panel or the dashboard uh, for GoToWebinar, you can submit questions. There's a tab there for questions there. So you can submit your questions there. Um, you know, we do have a short time period today. So Linda will try to get to all the questions that she can, but in the event that she, uh, we run out of time for those, um, you can also submit your questions directly to her email address at lclawson at themasync.com. Um, with all that said, I would now like to turn the webin over, uh, webinar over to Linda Clawson. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, today's agenda 
uh, what we're looking at is the version four, uh, 504 or the modification function level 504 transition. Uh, we're going to take a quick review of function levels in version 12. Uh, this is actually part three of a continuous set of webinars I'm presenting. As we activate here at Themis and test out function levels in version four, um, I kind of document the details. Uh, I document things that I ran into, uh, any issues or problems that I've run into. Uh, and then I set up some hints and tips to make it easier for me as I transition the rest of the 12 subsystems that I have to migrate and activate function levels in. So uh, what the intent is to share with you in advance anything that we've run into and how to make it easier for you as you're going through the various version uh, 12 activation levels, function levels. So uh, part one and two is out there in the webinars. Um, this one addresses modification 504. We got hit pretty hard on this one, uh, kind of a shocker. Um, when you're looking at function levels, please note in my favorite link, I've got it on the tabs in my browser, IBM Knowledge Center. <laughs> and um, under the heading in the table of contents, you'll have what's new in DB2 function levels. And it lists each of the function levels from modification. Uh, Function level 100, 500, 501, 502, 503, 504, 505, and 506 is now available. Okay. Please review those carefully. What the prereqs and corecs for each function level are. Look at the activation details and especially review the incompatibilities that is introduced with each function level. Remembering that until you activate that function level, they're not available and they're non-usable until static applications are bound at function level 504. So it really drives your implementation of your static. Your binds are a critical part of allowing function levels to be used or supported as well as in dynamic SQL, whether your system programmer sets the default to 504 or not, and whether they issue a set current application compatibility in their dynamic process. So it's the binds and the system level defaults, the gear, whether you're going to encounter those incompatibilities. Now, under 504, it was APAR uh, UI 61476 that was closed on February 2019 uh, that introduced the new code. Now, version four, uh, modification four, 504, does not require a cap mate. So you may see your software level, maintenance level, your load library level, your code level, in other words, and DB2 references it as the code level at 504. However, the catalog will still be at 503 because 504 works with the 503 catalog, DB2 catalog layout. Now, uh, two major areas that was introduced. Uh, one was the hardware-based Z14 Huffman compression. If you chose to use that, that means there is a hardware prereq there. The other one for application compatibility, uh, as they have newly supported built-in functions for the analytics accelerator for application, 
well, there's three arrays. Um, now, these new analytic accelerator functions are passed directly to the accelerator. Local DB2 doesn't try to execute them. They're automatically passed through. Uh, it just checks to make sure the data types are compatible for the function and then ships it over to the accelerator. There is also some new syntax alternatives, uh, trying to keep compatible across uh, platforms. Uh, so we'll take a look at those. But the biggest one that hit us was the DDL compatibility changes at modification 504. So a big caution here. If you activate 504 and you rebind all your interfaces at 504, including Spoofy, TEP2, your dynamic SQL prepared programs, which is what the instructions say, and your JDBC driver module, those packages. Be very cautious because 504 prevents the creation of deprecated objects. So if you're executing under modification 504, you cannot create, create a deprecated object. That's the big one that really kind of uh, hit us because we had a lot of deprecated objects out there. And so when we attempted to do certain things, such as alter and add a table to a segmented table space, it comes back and says, sorry, you can't do that. You're running under 504. So, and we had a lot of processing to work around that. Um, now, if you are at Z14, and you have the hardware implemented, you have the compression coprocessor, um, then your table space compression type can be the Huffman compression provided by IBM, hardware compression. And it only works against the universal table spaces. Uh, as you know, all of the current enhancements, all of the current performance enhancements are dependent on universal table spaces. So the writing's on the wall. We need to get those converted. So you have to make sure that you do have the coprocessor, compression coprocessor, the hardware implemented before your, sub, your systems administrator can turn on the Huffman compression, okay? It is faster, it, it performs better, okay, than the fixed length old algorithm, compression algorithm. Application compatibility. All right. You control the behavior of your static application packages at the package level. When you do your rebind, there's an Apple Compat option that tells the package at bind time, tells DB2 at bind time, under what function level you want the package to run. Do you want to run under the newly activated 504? Do you want to run under 503? You want to run under 500? Do you want to run under version 11 release one? It is up to you. You have to make those decisions. So the bind, the old bind, one size fits all, is pretty well out the door. You have to have good rebind procedures and you be, it should be able in your rebind to select the function level you want your static bound packages to execute under. Uh, the system administrator has a ZParm that they can set the default. 
Now there's two schools of thought there. When the system administrator activates a new function level, they also set the ZPARM default to be the current activated function level so that new static binds, if they don't code the Apple Compat on the bind, will pick up the new function level. And the default in the special register, current application compatibility for dynamic SQL, is the default that they set in the ZPARM. So if you do not want to bind using the new function level, you need to bind or rebind under the function level you want the package to execute at. And in dynamic SQL, set the application compatibility where you want it for the dynamic process. Now there's little changes there you'll have to worry about. Now is what is introduced? Well, uh, we have some SQL Spatial Register alternate names. So for example, our existing Spatial Register, um, you want to look at the current client application, what is the current server, what is the current time zone? Well, there are new syntax on alternatives. So you can say current server under, current underscore server instead of current server, current underscore time zone instead of time zone, but be careful because if you use these new syntax alternatives as the name of a column or a variable, okay, then DB2 will get confused. Do you mean the spatial register or do you mean the variable? So if it is a variable or a column name, you will have to use the delimited form of the column name or the variable. In other words, put it in single quotes. So you should write a, run a query to go out there to see, for example, something like this. Uh, to check your columns or your variables, you can go out to the catalog table, sys columns, sys variables, to see if you have any of those columns or variables before you activate 504, okay? And based on the results, don't forget you have packages out there that could be using those columns. So you should go out and check syspack dependency if you've got a table with one of those column names, et cetera, because those are the COBOL programs or the packages, could be a native SQL procedure package that is referring to that column name that will be ambiguous, okay? And make those adjustments. If you have good column naming conventions and variable naming conventions, you shouldn't run into this problem, but it depends on what you have used for naming conventions. All right, we also have a new six syntax all alternative for the null predicate. So instead of saying is null as two words, you can make it one word, is null, in your syntax. So I can select where is null um, is not null, the new syntax alternative for compatibility across the various SQL dialects where column not null instead of is not null, okay? So those are supported now, which makes easy, easier transition of, of your SQL across 
platforms and dialects. Whoops. Okay. Pass through built in functions. I want to try these out. Darn it. I don't have an ex analytic accelerator associated with my environment. So all it's going to do is check to make sure the arguments are the correct data type. If you have an analytics accelerator, however, these new built in functions for your OLAP queries, analytic queries, are passed directly over to the analytics. So those SQL statements will be passed over to the analytics accelerator. They're strictly a pass through. I can code them in DB2 standard, you know, but they're only executable on the analytics accelerator. So pass through only. Um, hopefully, my ZOS system programmer is looking at possibly getting us an analytics accelerator so I can test some of these out because I know John wanted to test some of them out and I had to give him the bad news. It's they won't run on our standalone subsystems, our subsystems as they are set up now. We don't have the analytic accelerator. So this is the big one, the one that hit us the hardest. If you activate modification 504 and you're executing under 504, you cannot create non-universal table spaces. You can't create hash tables. You can't create a synonym. Okay? You must use the DSNAC COX stored procedure instead of the old one to get the recommendations from your real-time stats. Now, existing objects are supported. I mean, they still run. I still have some segmented table spaces out there, but I can't do any DDL against them. If I'm under 504, I have to, if I'm doing it in Spoofy or TEP2 or TIAD, Batch Dynamic SQL, DDL statements, I have to set my application compatibility to 503 if I want to alter, for example, alter and add or add a new table to a segmented table space. Because if I'm executing under 504 modification level, it doesn't work. It gives me an error. Synonyms. IBM warned you a long time ago they were going to get rid of synonyms. We're supposed to use aliases instead and re realize an alias without a location is a local alias works just like a synonym. The advantage is, is you can also set up remote al an alias for a remote object if you specify the remote location and you've defined that remote server in your communications database that you're going to be a client and you're going to connect, do an implicit connect and go for there. So it works for both local or remote objects if you need a alias name for it. Five oh four. Any create table space statements that are non universal table spaces. If the syntax, when you create table space, just says seg size without max partitions, without num partitions, it is by default a universal partition by growth table space. 
If you are running under 504 and you create synonym, you'll get an error. If you create a table that specifies an existing table space, you'll get an error. Single table table spaces. If you create a table or alter a table to use hash organization, since support for hash in 504 is dropped, you'll get an error. So there are a lot of us, I don't know about you, but we've got these little bitty code tables. I mean, the entire set of rows on these little code tables don't even fit in a 4K page, the entire contents. Well, we put multiple code tables in a single segmented table space. So every time I want to manage one of those, I have to make sure that whatever I'm using is setting my Apple Compat to an application function level less than 504 to be able to do it. So, so let's assume I'm running under 504. I'm not doing my set to 503. And I try to create a table space. That's a segmented table space create. I create the first table in there and point it to my table space. When I attempt to put the second table in there, pointing to that table space, I get a negative 646. Sorry, cannot be created in the specified table space because what used to be a segmented table space create now defaults to a partition by growth. And universal table spaces only allow one table per table space. What I have to do if this is in a dynamic SQL process, such as Spoofy or DSNTIAD, TEP2, what I usually use as batch TSO, dynamic SQL execution of a DDL statement. I have to set the application compatibility to a modification level less than 504. Then it'll work. Then I actually get a segmented table space. And the two tables are allowed to be assigned to it. So when you're dynamically creating these, or when you're creating these and you get that Negative SQL code, oops, we'll reset it. Now that's fine for your local activity. However, what about your products? What about your third party product programs? that issue the DDL, what are they bound at? What about your distributed processes that come in? What is your JLR modules for your JDBC driver on your server bound at? Are they doing DDL? Are they referencing and making alterations and assuming they're getting segmented table spaces? So you have to look at all your interfaces and how they handle 504. And all of your products, how do they handle 504 objects? Okay, we ran into that problem, by the way. Now, with this continuous, just as a review, remember with continuous delivery, you have your code level. That's where I'm applying maintenance to the target libraries, doing my apply, apply check, okay, and then accept. So my code level could be at a totally different level than the activated function level. My catalog level, can be less than my code level. And my app 
function level I've activated can be less than my code level. And depending on the catalog level maintenance dependency, my function level could be equal to less than or greater than the catalog level. Now, as far as my static applications, I have the DECP modular module that your static COBOL, PL1, whatever programs look at for the pre compiler or code processor to see what SQL level is being supported. Normally, when they activate a new level, 504, for example, they will set the SQL level for 504 for the pre-compiler and coprocessor to use to make sure it's a valid SQL statement. Because with continuous delivery, we keep adding new statements. Hey. Apple compat on your bind or rebind can be equal to whatever the activated level is. Let's say I activated 504. I can rebind under 504. If I set my ZParm Apple compat to 504 on a bind of a new package, and the bind does not have the Apple Compat option set, it picks it up out of the ZParm. Rebinds do not look at the default in the ZParm. If you rebind and do not code Apple Compat, it picks up what the old package that's out there, application compatibility is, and just rebinds that at that level to see if there's a better access path. So there's a lot of confusion as to when the subsystem default application compatibility is used. It is used as the default special register current application compatibility for dynamic prepares. It is used when you do a bind of a new static package or bind of a new package and you don't specify Apple Compat. It is not looked at when you take an existing package and just rebind it. It uses what either is in the rebind syntax or what the package Apple Compat was in the catalog. So you're rebinding out of the catalog an existing package. And if you don't specify Apple Compat, it uses the application compatibility that was in the package, that the package was originally bound with. So making sure you understand that. A lot of confusion on that. Now, if I do a display group, I could have down here on the bottom, bright red, this is the code level. This is my maintenance code level. So I have applied all of the maintenance uh, to bring my code up to 504. That means I'm eligible to activate 504. However, please note my catalog level is at 503. I currently have only activated 503. So none of the 504 functions are available. I'm running under 503 rules, okay? But I'm eligible to activate 504. Now, you may be clear back at 500, activated level 500. 
They may have performed the cap mate for 503. They may have the code level at 504, 505, 506. As long as the code level is greater or equal to the catalog level. But you're activated at 500. You can't use any of the features that were introduced at 501, 502, 503, or 504. They're not eligible. We can't bind above the activated level. And we can't set our current application compatibility above the current activated function level, current function level. So a lot of people hold off. Okay. Um, implementation binds and rebinds. <clears throat> you have to make some decisions and you should have some good guidelines. When are you going to change the startup ZPARM parameter? The default Apple Compact. Do you want to do it as soon as you activate the function level? Or do you want to wait until a few processes have tested out under that new application compatibility level? You should have guidelines as to when to rebind. You have your package level rebinds. What about the supplied interfaces? You've got all of those interface packages for the interfaces, your spoofy packages. Your TEP2, TIAD, those dynamic processes. Your JDBC drivers. When those supplied interfaces, the assumption is when I apply maintenance, it tells me to rebind those interfaces to activate the function level and remind those interfaces. What about product packages? Here's where we ran into a big problem. Um, maintenance level on IIDR data replicator is not at the same level as DB2. I activated 504, and poor Tom, his, his interface program that he was reinstalling started failing. There is a program module that goes out and creates the objects. Well, ID, ID or did a replicator when he was setting up for a new set for a class to teach, it still uses segmented table spaces, multi-table segmented table spaces. And we need bound that program into that subsystem. That's a brand new bind of the interface. Everything started failing when he was running the setup program module scripts. So we had to go back and rebind his product interface programs at 503, hard code the Apple Compact, because it wasn't an option in their supplied bind to implement those packages. Okay. So when you rebind, you have to make sure whatever the process is you're rebinding that you rebind it, those packages, at the function level that those packages will support, okay? Before you do any of that, if you're data sharing, 
make sure each of the data sharing members of your group after maintenance and applying functional level code and that each of the data sharing members have been restarted under the new code base. So when you do display, all the members are under your code base, a single code base before you start activating or rebinding. Okay, and you can check in the catalog what was the last cat mate you did? What was the last activation you did? What was the last maintenance update applied to the code level? It's kept track of in the IBM catalog table, sys levels updates. And it'll show you when the row was inserted and it'll have an effective and it keeps track of when that was. And it actually has the operation text, basically. There are some, you can go out there and look at these new IBM supply global variables in version 12 to check what is the product ID, what is the catalog level, and what is the default SQL level? And it will get it. And those are good, except if you haven't refreshed, you haven't uh, reloaded your startup parms. Okay. Uh, they may be a little late. I mean, we've got to have those reloaded for it to recognize them and reset the global variables. So be careful of that. It may lag your actual maintenance approach. So until you recycle the subsystem, they may be a little out of behind the scene. I like display group because it gives me right now, what am I running under? Bind and rebind, don't forget. Apple Compat, now in version 12, we can run version 10, release one, version 11, release one, version 12, release one, modification 100, modification 200, five, uh, 100, modification 500, modification 501, modification 502, modification 503, modification 504. If you're doing proper plan management, plan management extended, okay? And we don't create duplicate access paths. Mm. Um, INSYS packages will be the current package. INSYS copy, pack copy, will be the previous and the original the original bind and the previous package version, that package, the previous rebound package. And it will tell you the function level. If you're binding queries in the sysquery catalog table, it'll tell you the function level that query was bound under. So you can go out there and see where they're executing at, what level they're executing under. So you can go out there. Um, I had a package uh, running under version 11 R1. Then I did a re, that's the original. Then I did a rebind for modification 100. And then I did the current rebind is at 500. And this is running in my 504 activated subsystem. But that's the level I'm comfortable with right now for that current program package. It doesn't need any of the new features added. Okay, plan ahead for this continuous delivery. Get everyone familiar with levels. 
look at your standards and procedures, re review the changes that might affect your migration, and make sure you decide when the appropriate time. Like I said, there's two schools of thought on the Apple Compat default in your subsystem parameter. I have my two main subsystems and I keep it whatever function level I activate. I set my ZParm to that level. And if they run into problems, they got to get a hold of me. Okay. And use the text test option to see if everything's there to activate that level before you activate it. Uh, make sure you look at the Corex and Prerex and watch those enhancements that have recently uh, been added to DB212 via APARS in, uh, in the Knowledge Center. It's a good way of tracking things that are coming in and coming through. What's coming next? Whoops. Um, use your Knowledge Center. There's some good documentation out there. Some red books, performance topics, uh, exploring continuous delivery, how you can make your procedures easy. They're almost like mini migrates, some of these. The only two that we ran into problems with is when we went beyond 500, because to go beyond 500, to either go to 501, 502, or 503 to activate, and I can do skip function levels, do multiple cap mains, and then go from 501, 500 all the way to 503. But if I want to go beyond 500, we had to update all of our JDBC drivers and put a lot of maintenance on APAR on our server and APAR on our gateway. And finally, we changed our approach to get beyond 500. Then the, this one, 504, was the next, next bottleneck we ran into, was with the drop support and with the packages that we have in our environment, we have, you know, to rerun, to build the objects for the package to use, the product to use, and find that the product is still using segment and table space. The product was still using synonyms. So we had to back off and run the product under 503. And I used uh, for those uh, distributed processes coming in, a dynamic SQL coming in from Durda. I had to, since I'd already bound the JDBC driver packages that live on DB2, uh, I had to, at 504, what I did is I set up a profile table for the individual auth IDs that were attempting to do things that wasn't supported in 504. So take a look at possibly using profiles to set your Apple Compat for people that need to be at a less lower level. Okay. Um, I, there's a webinar out there on profiles, and I also did an IDUG article for profiles. Profile tables are helpful for setting spatial register and global variables. I didn't see any. Oh, Norris, you lost your audio. Did anybody else lose audio? That's the only question I had. Must have been on his end. Because um, nobody else reported the problem. All right. Uh, we have um, the transition class. It's a three-day class coming up June 1st. I'll be teaching that. Uh, check out the webinars. There's a lot of them. Follow us on Twitter. And don't forget, we have over 400 IT courses. I just saw 
in the news the other day that I believe it was Philadelphia was desperate for COBOL programmers because they have a whole list of, and they can't find anybody to hire to work on COBOL. Well, we got a COBOL training classes. We can take your students that come out of college and make them COBOL mainframe programmers. So we do have those. We also have a, a good selection of professional development classes for application developer, database administrators, and system in administrators. We even have boot camps to take an application developer and make them a DBA, to take an existing DBA and make them a systems administrator for DB2. So we have these boot camps that we offer as well. And hopefully, oops, hopefully this was beneficial for you. And at this point, I am going to, John, do you have anything else you wanted to say to the group? Um, I've pretty well covered everything I can. And please, if you've got questions, email me. I'm glad to handle your questions at any time. No, I don't have any questions. Uh, Linda, just like to thank everybody for attending today and also and also to remind everybody if they go out to our website there, you'll see there's two upcoming webinars in May as well one on May 7th for getting started with Java and also one on May 14th for accessing databases from Java so feel free to sign up for those you can see them on our website themasync.com under the webinars tab you can register there thank you again Linda for today